and get started. So thank you guys and welcome to our first learning lab. So this is really exciting because obviously the purpose of learning labs are a way of getting better together and basically creating a collaborative culture. So it's exciting that you guys are all able to join us um, for our first learning lab in the district. So basically we have kind of the protocol on the sheet for the learning lab and you'll see the times and you can find kind of follow along. This is the pre-brief that we're going to start from 8.30 to 9. And then following that will be the observation in Jen's room. And so basically we're going to start with, Jen's going to give us some background kind of about her lesson leading up until this point. And then I'm going to start with basically some norms for when we enter her classroom and when we're going in and viewing the observation and all of that. So if you kind of want to give us kind of some details about your lesson. Okay. Well, I this is kind of a, a rough scratch, especially for the lessons after since um, I haven't uh, taught them yet this year, but I thought this might be easier. Carrie and I talked last fall and we were just talking about um, making sense of the writer's workshop in the first 30 days of writing. And we were talking about how some lessons kind of correlate with first 30 or 20 days of reading, however you do it. And so some things kind of intertwine and sometimes you sit there and you feel like uh, you're possibly repeating yourself, yet, oh, this is a really good aha moment and a good review. So I thought I would just print off the lesson plan so you could see, especially Jackie and Karen, you can see which lessons I kind of uh, skip and which lessons I put together. Um, however, you can't, if you have questions about any that are missing, please ask me because then I can tell you, oh, that's because we do this in reading. All right, so, um, so do I abide by this completely? Um, I make sure that everything is covered, but it might be covered in a different area, to uh, put it that way. So if you, um, let's take a look at maybe day 14. Let's kind of start a few days before today. So I guess it'd be last Friday. Um, kind of leading up to last Friday, which was really diving into the pre-writing, the first step of the writing process, we built up and did some individual activities and some whole group activities to really prepare us for the big whole group activity. And I don't know how you all do the first uh, 30 days of writing or your expectations to kind of set the tone for your year in writing. But in, um, in my class, I, I follow this, but I do more of this big personal narrative together. So we kind of create the student that really doesn't exist in, in my classroom and we create a, a personal narrative for them, a story that's happened. It can be a little tricky because you don't want to um, allude to the fact that this is realistic fiction or something like that, so you really have to remind the students a lot that, okay, this this really happened to somebody, even though they don't exist yet. I know that's a little confusing, but the way, the way that it is set up is that it's a whole group um, activity. It's a whole group um, write. So, um, so we do start with a lot of the mentor text that this book has, um, from the important book, and then the students do short writing activities um, where they kind of design what's important to them, and then they draw, um, illustrate a picture like that. So that's kind of their first um, piece of evidence that they're an author in my, in my classroom. And then we go on to other mentor texts. Um, some I, I just think, oh, I can't believe they put that mentor text in here. I love it, like uh, Arthur Writes a Story. I love that book, and I think it's great that these aren't all um, books by by people I've never heard of. Sometimes I feel like, oh, I've never heard of that book before, and then I really have to research it and figure out how people use it. Um, and this was one of them that I, uh, two years ago, I had never heard of. Wow, I have never had a better turn and talk than I've had with this book. It was, they just, I, you were in my, uh, Holly's been in my room for every writing lesson. Um, it was to the point where it couldn't even be a turn and talk anymore. People just wanted to make sure everybody heard. It was incredible. Um, but then there are some times where I might have a book like today's book is not a mentor text from this curriculum. So if I feel like there's a book 
that I can slide in that fits better than the one they're giving, or maybe they don't present one, maybe there isn't a book for that lesson, like today is day 16 and um, this curriculum doesn't have a mentor text to go with it, but the way that I set my lesson up and what I wanted the students to get out of it, I slid it in there. So, you know, it's just um, teachable moments, I guess. Um, something that Jackie shared with me last year is these writing folders that then have um, <coughs> the writing stages. So we're gonna try this this year. And so you'll see today in the lesson that we've done something um, that we have for evidence in the pre-writing. The thing about the folders that's a little tricky I've noticed so far is a lot of this is done in our writing notebook. So I just have to remind the kids that not everything goes in here. And not everything goes in your writing notebook. It's just a way to organize some of the th tools that we're using. So anyway, if we look back at um, Friday, that's where we talked about many different ways to organize. In the past two years, I, I never thought of this, but as I was showing the students these different graphic organizers, I just pulled out random uh, graphic organizers that I've had. You know, uh, this kind of a story map, or this kind of a story map, or an event timeline. Um, the cluster map, which we actually did do together. Um, sequence chain. And then they were just getting really excited about all the different ones that I had. When we came to an agreement on the one that we were going to use, I felt like some kids, you know, were wishing, oh, I wish we would have used maybe the cluster, or the, the sequence chain. And so that gave me the idea, you know what, this year for our five big writing units, I am never going to delegate which one they have to use. I'm just always going to have like maybe some file folders and say, okay, it's time for the part of the pre-writing process where you organize your ideas now. So how are you going to do it? You can choose which graphic organizer will help you do that. Um, so more of a, um, an orange, right? So more for the orange kid. Like I'm not gonna force everybody who's gold to, you know, or think that everybody's gold and use the same graphic organizer. Um, so yeah, there was that. Um, yesterday was a wonderful lesson as well, which I kind of veered off from um, the book and added another mentor text. But I wanted kids to see that, yes, you are authors. And this was written, I know Carrie, I think you have this book too, or maybe it's Carol. Um, this is written by a first grade class. And I wanted the kids to see that yeah, you are authors, and you can be an author, and anybody can write a book. We talk a lot about Patricia Polacco and how she was a struggling reader. And just because you're a struggling reader doesn't mean that you're a struggling writer. And it doesn't mean you always have to be a struggling write, uh, reader. So um, that was pretty nice to use yesterday. Um, we just talk about all, what pre-write, that's kind of where we're at. We haven't gotten into any other um, stages. They've been mentioned, but I haven't gone in, into any other um, great detail about the other stages of writing so far. It's more um, really expectations during writer's workshop. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What are you doing? What are you not supposed to be doing? Um, and it, the number one reason that I really like this curriculum is because it develops enjoyment for writing. I cannot tell you <laughs> how excited I get when I teach these first 30 days. Um, You'll, you'll hear in my lesson today about um, how excited I am because of something that I plan to do. But it is just pretty neat to see kids that are all of a sudden dedicated to writing. Because, I mean, I don't know about your experience, but I feel like that's kind of the one thing that you, you know, it's independent writing time, and then you have kids just sitting there. Or you say, okay, get your best three ideas, and it's almost recess, and you have kids that are just sitting there. They don't know what to put at all. Or they're putting down ideas that maybe they hear somebody else say, or that they're just, you know, that aren't really relevant to what you're doing. And so I feel like this gives a lot of purpose for them, and I think that is the piece that, that maybe is missing for the, the kids who don't like to write, is what's the purpose of this? <coughs> so. And that leads us into, if you kind of look at the protocol, the focus questions for the learning lab. So basically, when you go into Jen's room for the observation, these are kind of some of the questions that you may want to think to yourself, and also um, kind of the note-taking tool on the back. There's also that focus question, those questions that you can kind of um, 
remind yourself about when you're kind of in there and taking notes when you're observing Jen's lesson. So what structures are evident and in place for students to be successful writers? Do the students understand the pre-writing stage of the writing process? And imagine we walk into your own classroom. Is there a feeling of purpose that the students are dedicated to writing? And are your reading and writing blocks connected? Meaning, do they, not connected, like are they flowing back to back? Because obviously not all schedules work that way. But are you um, basically relating your reading to your writing block? Because they are so connected as readers and writing. They shouldn't be two totally separate things and ideas. Um, obviously we know that when you're a better writer, it obviously leads you to become a better reader. So they go hand in hand. Um, so those are kind of the focus things we want you thinking about when you enter um, Jen's room. And also then Jen, <coughs> on the back for that note taking tool, the look fors, are there anything in particular that you want them as an audience to look for when they enter your room or observing your lesson? Yeah, so I have a, a couple things. One kind of um, management kind of piece. Uh, I, I do have a student that's autistic. And I, I did tell the class, you know, I remember in PD, Dana said, why trick them? Tell them, tell them what's going on. So they know you're coming. Um, I did have to go into uh, much more detail with him about what's going on. And um, uh, so, yeah, I don't know where that's going to go. But uh, he didn't seem nervous at all. So, so that was good. I think he'll just have, um, he'll be the kid that might be looking at you more than others because he might be a little thrown, thrown off. Um, so something to look for, and this would be great for you, Sarah, since you teach second grade. So when I say, do the students understand the pre-writing stage of the writing process? So I almost kind of believe it's a maturity level thing, too. You know, they can't really understand that uh, you pre-write in first grade. I mean, I mean, maybe in very little detail and big graphic organizers, they can start to wrap their head around it. But when I, like when I look at my son who's now in second grade, I mean I looked at it, you know, preschool, kindergarten, like all of his writing and it's so important just initially to just put thoughts on paper, you know, and to kind of move up the sequence from there. So now in third grade, we're, we are really focusing on the five stages of writing. So there, there is pre-writing and there needs to be evidence. You aren't just getting out your notebook and writing something. That's not what we're doing. We are thinking, we're, you know, and it, and it might kind of be sort of a chaos think in the beginning. You might be just jotting down words or phrases or creating a web, but you, you know that that is leading to something bigger. So that's um, something I want you to look for. We've really been emphasizing it. Um, I, I'm sure I still have some kids if I asked, what's the first stage of the writing process? They would look at me, you know, a little confused because they're not, they're not seeing the, you know, if I'm just asking it, they're not seeing the evidence that we went through. If I said, okay, look at this. What is this graphic organizer we did evidence of? Well, pre-writing, that's when we brainstormed. So do you see the difference of actually having the physical evidence rather than just asking them? Kind of like asking them, uh, what standard are you working on right now? Ugh, deer in the headlights, right? Okay, show me what you're doing and then they can explain it and then they can talk about it. So, um, other than that, yeah. those are my two big things that I ask that you look for. Um, you know, and that all, uh, the evidence and uh, understanding pre-writing goes back to the purpose. That all goes back to why do we pre-write? Why can't we just jump into our draft? So do they understand the purpose of the five stages or that there is a process? Do you guys have any clarifying questions that you want to ask Jen about the lesson that you're going to see today or questions leading up or just questions in general about um, writing or any clarifying questions that you're wondering? What part did you play in the coaching aspect of this? So Jen and I have been meeting before um, we met, basically before school started to start the planning of kind of like the first 30 days. And then um, 
just because I didn't want to come to the learning lab and then be the facilitator and then, oh, this is what we're doing. So we've been kind of doing like a coaching partnership so I could see obviously leading up to the lesson today um, how she leads up to that point. So I've kind of been involved in planning and viewing the lessons and seeing the mentor text and all of this in process and just collaborating with Jen and also then so the students you know have been familiar with seeing me in there and so that's kind of the part I've been playing. And I would say a little bit of co-teaching in there too just because it's after 15 days it got kind of hard for Holly and for anybody to just observe so mm -hmm. we thought it would just you know as long as you're here. <laughs> <coughs> Any other questions you guys have? Well, mine's not toward the lesson, but where did you get your folders? Because I would love to have something like that in my classroom. Um, Lake Shore. So, is that going to take an order up there or not? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I also thought they would be an extremely useful tool for my kids because I do have a lot of lower level kids. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like that organization piece, and it looked to me like it kind of explains what the pre-writing mm -hmm. is, what's um, the second step. And it has everything laid out right you in know, front of them. And you're right, it, too. Um, this emphasizes that you need to have the process up in your room, mm -hmm. but um, to have it at your workspace when you're working, <coughs> Mm -hmm. It's probably pretty nice. And Jackie could speak more to whether um, or how she likes them. I'm well, I have the idea. Great. Okay. Well. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I, I would agree. It's just we should have it right there in front of them to mm -hmm. remind them of each stage and to physically have them move. Like, okay, well, now you're ready for the revision process. So you know, even that step to physically have them moving their writing over, I think, yeah, is powerful. And I think I'll really like this. Hank, did you go through your checklist so many times, and I know this is for the debrief too, but um, I'm done with the revising, I'm done with editing. Really, in five minutes. Well, that's interesting. Why don't you go back to your checklist and make sure that you checked all those things and you've done all of those steps. Something else it has is overused words, so it gets into synonyms, which is huge third grade skill. Um, possible writing topics, and then some commonly misspelled words too, which is nice. Yeah, I think it's a really nice, seems to be a really nice school. A million years ago, I took two, two pocket folders, uh -huh. and yeah. put them together, and yeah. 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 yeah, so that's what you're going to have to do. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my last school sight word. Yeah. Yeah. Put the one folder yeah. in the yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. That I back then, yeah. you could be in a yeah. dead yeah. house right yeah. now. Yeah. It just takes so much time, but still, I can do it. But it is nice to have them actually move their piece like from stage to stage. To stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it feels like it kind of helps them move along, get away from, mm -hmm. oh, I'm stuck here, I'm still, like, what are we doing? Right. So that they can actually see where, okay, I was at pre-writing, now I'm moving, I'm moving. So, mm -hmm. yeah. my kids just kind of like to move, so. Or another, through their notebook yeah. and not know where anything is. Right. I was going to say another part I liked about it is I am terrible about like having short writing conferences and really getting to all of my kids during class. Mm -hmm. So since they had all their writing in their folders and I just always had them in a basket rather than in their chair pockets, so I would just periodically take all their folders home and then I could check in on their writing and see where they're at and how they're doing versus carrying home 25 notebooks. Mm -hmm. So that was nice. So are you having them um, rip pages out of their notebook and put it in there as they go? Is mm -hmm. doing it? Any other questions about the lesson before we go in? So the norms when we go into Jen's room, stay close to the action so you can see and hear what's going on um, for the students as learners. Record detailed notes that are aligned to the observation for the debrief debriefing session so you can use um, this note-taking tool and obviously kind of the notes that are the Jen's look for's based around that and also the focus questions and no talking to the students or other teachers during the lab and the observation when we're in there 
and we're going to leave the room obviously as we left it, um, or how it was when we came in. We're not going to be touching books or anything, which I know you all know. And we do have the golden broom in. Don't <laughs> <laughs> no, no, mess it up for no sneak. Yeah, no. Um, avoid being a distraction in the classroom and maintain silence and do not take it upon yourself to teach the students. We're just in there as observers, even though you're all teachers and I know that's hard to do. And then just main, maintain a positive ad, attitude and respect for the lab host. So it's obviously, I know Jen's our collaborative teacher, but it does take, you know, it's, it's always a little bit scary and it takes a lot of courage to do this so um, just maintaining the positive attitude when we go in there so those are the norms for the observation and then obviously when we come back we will um, debrief all of your notes from the page and what you saw from the observation any questions all right so we're going in there at 9:15 until 9.45 and we'll view the lesson and they're going to actually be in their seats and Jen will just kind of be in front of the room and kind of by her TV but she will have to make a segue to get to her computer because the book, the mentor text she's going to be sharing, she's actually going to have read um, on her TV. She's going to have like a YouTube video or something. So she'll have to kind of make a segue to her computer so just leave that area otherwise Kind of the back area you can feel free to stand there are some chairs but i encourage you to kind of if they are doing any writing or whatever get you know around the student so you can see that student evidence of what they're working on so <clears throat> yeah so i have like a reading center when you walk into my room so don't uh, be hesitant to just walk across the room towards it because that'll be like a different view too and then you won't all be in one spot and feel free to move around and stuff, you know, throughout the lesson. And then I'll kind of, at 9.45, I'll just kind of signal and we'll all flow out, so. And I just want to thank you for responding to me and volunteering to do this. Um, well, I kind of persuaded Alyssa, but <laughs> <laughs> she's got a whole new job and it's a lot for her to be here, but, um, but really, thank you for responding and participating in the Learning Lab. at me. After a while, it occurred to me that I was supposed to ask what happened. <coughs> so I did. What happened? Remember the day you put the note on my desk telling me how you saved the runaway dog in the street? Yes. Well, somebody else left a note on my desk. I know, I said. Dear and tap. She stared at me, and then at my mother, and she blinked and shook her head. No, not dear and tap. Okay, we'll stop there. All right. Kiddos, we are going to start our writing lesson today from our desks, so you can stay put. All right, you've had a chance to sit and listen to me read for a little while. Now I need you to be active in the learning process for writing class, okay? All right. I want to start off by telling you a short story about myself. Um, my friend and I, we've decided that we're going to write a children's book. And we're in the very beginning stages of this. What's that called? Beginning stages of writing a book. Turn and tell your neighbor what the beginning stage of the writing process is. Okay, what did you come up with? Fab, what's the first stage? The beginning. The beginning. And what is that called in the writing process? What's the first step? Tyler. Pre-writing. Right. So we're in this pre-writing stage, right? We're thinking about ideas, okay? And we're thinking about a topic. What do we want this to be about? What will our purpose be, right? All those brainstorming events in the pre-writing stage. Well, this morning I woke up and I had an idea. It was a good one. What do you think I did? 
turn and talk to a neighbor. What did I do? All right, Moira, what did I do with that idea? Oh, I know what you're going to say. I just stuck it in my head and said, yep, I'm going to remember to tell my friend that later. Is that what I did? No? What do you think I did? Maybe a sticky note. Yes, we talked about those authors that carry sticky notes with them. And they just write little notes on there and then they pile them up in their pre-writing stage. What do you think, Bella? A notebook. A notebook is another idea and that is what I did. I have a little notebook by my bed. And then when I come up with this idea in the middle of the night, you know, and you have those, like a dream. When you have a dream that's so real and you think you won't forget it, you're gonna tell somebody later on, but then all of a sudden you forget it. Kind of like the idea for the book. I didn't want to forget it. As excited as I was, I knew that that was a step I had to take. Putting it on paper, okay? That action of putting it on the paper makes it real, okay? That's what I needed to do. So then I got to thinking about this book that I bought this, um, this summer. What do you do with an idea? So here's this idea my friend and I have. Here's this idea I came up with this morning to add to some other ideas that I had already had. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna read this to my class. But then I got to thinking this summer, I wonder if there's somebody else that reads it, like on YouTube or maybe the author reads it, where there's some background music. A soldier that didn't come back from overseas. And then you're sad. And so I wanted to find something that had a little background music that helped you to get even more excited about the writing process. I like the background music. When this woman reads this book, it adds a little something. For me, it got me even more excited about our idea that we came up with. All right? So eyes on the TV, and I'm going to mirror my computer to the TV. And we're going to listen to what do you do with an idea. And then after today, it's free for you to add to your reading log if you want to, and then just keep rotating it around, okay? And just a sidebar while this is pulling up, this author has um, other books, like what do you do with a math problem? Really about problem solving. It's even one on friendship. What do you do with an idea? One day I had an idea. Where did it come from? Why is it here? I wondered, what do you do with an idea? At first, I didn't think much of it. It seemed kind of strange and fragile. I didn't know what to do with it, so I just walked away from it. I acted like it didn't belong to me. But it followed me. I worried what others would think. What would people say about my idea? I kept it to myself. I hid it away and didn't talk about it. I tried to act like everything was the same as it was before my idea had showed up. But there was something magical about my idea. I had to admit, I felt better and happier when it was around. It wanted food. It wanted to play. Actually, it wanted a lot of attention. It grew bigger and we became friends. I showed it to other people, even though I was afraid of what they would say. I was afraid that if people saw it, they would laugh at it. I was afraid they would think it was silly, and many of them did. They said it was no good. They said it was too weird. They said it was a waste of time and that it would never become anything. And at first, I believed them. I actually thought about giving up on my idea. I almost listened to them. But then I realized, what do they really know? This is my idea, I thought. No one knows it like I do, and it's okay if it's different and weird and maybe a little crazy. I decided to protect it, to care for it. I fed it good food, I worked with it, I played with it, but most of all, I gave it my attention. My idea grew and grew, and so did my love for it. I built it a new house, one with an open roof where I could look up at the stars, a place where it could be safe to dream. I liked being with my idea. It made me feel more alive, like I could do anything. 
It encouraged me to think big, and then to think bigger. It shared its secrets with me. It showed me how to walk on my hands, because it said, it is good to have the ability to see things differently. I couldn't imagine my life without it. Then, one day, something amazing happened. My idea changed right before my very eyes. It spread its wings, took flight, and burst into the sky. I don't know how to describe it, but it went from being here to being everywhere. It wasn't just a part of me anymore. It was now a part of everything. And then, I realized what you do with an idea. You change the world. So, that is a really good book for anybody who believes, like, their idea isn't really worth anything. Or, maybe you're too young to have an idea that big. Well, if it came to you, it is your idea, and you own it. And ideas do change the world, don't they? Mm -hmm. Didn't, um... The September 12th book, Change the World. After we talked about 9-11 yesterday, didn't that book make us feel better? It wasn't so scary anymore, was it? Okay, kind of the last part that we're going to talk about with pre-writing before we get into the rough draft, which is the second stage of the writing process, is this chart here. Beginning, middle, and end. And we've touched on this just a small bit, that our story needs to have a beginning, middle, and end. And good for you, because you already knew that, didn't you? When I asked you, what does every story need? We talked about story elements. They need characters. They need, uh, what else do they need? Name some more things. Tyler. Plot. Plot. Read. Setting. Setting. Oh! What's the difference, again, between a plot and a setting? Ava, tell me what a setting is in a book. It's um, it's where the story takes place. Great. And how about the plot? We were really mixed up. Remember we did those sticky notes to try to help us? What about the plot of the story? Let's do a turn and talk. Think about some things that the plot could be. You got to use the word will. Ask her what it means. Right? Okay, Thea, what did your uh, trio over there come up with? Well, within the plot, there are other story elements. But the plot is like, remember I gave you that analogy, like uh, the meat and the bun, right? Like it's the big part of it. So what is that? Bella. Not the characters, the story. There is animals that actually Good. So it is a sequence of events that happen. Right? And you have to have a beginning, middle, and end, and you, it would be very strange to have those in different orders. Right? It would make quite so much sense. In our um, writing notebooks here, oh, it's the first one, I guess, we did that graphic organizer, a story map interview, where we got really excited about throwing out all these ideas. And I know there was some talk after about changing some things. And in the pre-writing stage, that is perfectly okay to do. You can change your mind. That's what it's all about. Once you put those words on the paper, it's not final. You can change. So we're going to start right here at the beginning. So keeping in mind what we did up there, keeping it in mind if we want to leave something the same that's up there, we can. But otherwise, character or characters. <laughs> Cheyenne's not here, but she thought of a great idea. She came up to me after class and she said, you know, the class was really debating whether the char main character should be a boy or a girl. And I thought this was cool, kind of. She said, why can't they be twins? Why can't it be a brother and a sister celebrating their birthday together? So that's something to think about. What do you think? Hey, you, this is our main 
character? What do you want it to be? Do a turn and talk with your neighbor. Discuss what if it, if it can be your decision. So she's pretty far away, and there are two of them, so you might want to be the one to move over so they can hear me. Double the fun? Yeah, Okay. Okay, Noah, what did you three talk about? Uh, it could be a girl and a girl. And it could be a boy and a boy. What do we want? And we don't have to say what's fair. It is what it is. This is this person's story. It happened to them. So it doesn't really matter if it's one way or the other. But we need to decide. <coughs> Olivia. Twins. Twins. All right. You want to write it up? So I'm assuming that you're going to say twins, one girl, one boy. Yeah. That's kind of how it got brought up. Okay. So we need to describe both of them then. What's the girl like? And boys, you can answer. What's what's the girl like? What kind of character does she have? What's her personality like? Will says, I don't know. Oh, I'm not a girl. But think about girls in your life. Think about the girls you like to hang out with. Oh, <laughs> well, you're hanging out with Abby and Olivia here. What do you think? When you think of a third grade girl in your class, what do you think of? Will? They're stylish. Oh, okay. Let's put Will covering stylish up here. That's really not, um, well, actually, your style does represent your personality, so that'll work. Ava. Excited. She's an excited girl. Good. I think Ava's pulling out what she is. Jenna. Joyful. Joyful. Noah. Uh, adventure. Adventurous. Which, uh, maybe we should quick discuss our topic again. The amusement park ride. She's going to have to be adventurous. Although maybe one of the twins isn't. Hmm, I don't know. What do you think, Reed? Um, um, expression. Okay, what do you mean by that? Like, happy. So, when you say expression, do you mean she shows her feelings on the outside? When she's happy, you can tell. When she's sad, you can tell. So, she's expressive. I like that because some people are really good at hiding feelings on the inside. Yeah, why don't you write expressive? How about the boy? What is the boy like? Ethan? <coughs> Your best friend. What do you love most about your best friend? Okay, put that one down. Loves to play games. That goes with uh, the amusement park ride, right? We might be at a fair or Six Flags or whatever we choose. Probably gonna like to play games. Bad. Watch TV. <laughs> okay, and that is an idea. Um, one of the siblings maybe would rather watch TV. Yeah. Okay, think about our story. Is that going to add a lot of detail? Possibly not. Think about it a little more and let me know if you still want it on there. Um, expressive. And we don't have to worry about conventions. We don't have to worry about spelling in the pre-writing stage. Remember, we're just getting ideas down as fast as they come. Dylan. He's happy. He's a happy kid, too. Oh, lucky mom to have two kids who are so happy. I love it. Moira. Good sport. A good sport. So that goes good with playing games, being a good sport. Absolutely. All right. Okay, let's kind of stop now. We can always add to this. Let's move on to the problem. Who remembers we did not want to move away from this problem? If you don't remember, my chicken scratch up there. What was the problem in the story? I don't know how you are going to find a solution to this, but uh, Kyra. Yes. Kyra, <laughs> why don't you guys, uh, or pick a friend if your wrist hurts. So, so now we are, you know, are both the twins stuck upside down in the amusement yeah. park ride? Yes. Okay. And one falls out. Oh, <laughs> there's not going to be as that in the story. Okay. Um, so now, um, let's go back to setting. Sorry, I skipped uh, the setting in the beginning, but we do need to decide. Is this the Winnesheet County Fair? Is this Disneyland? Is this Six Flags? Is it Valley Fair? What is it? 
Don't try and talk because I, I know you've been places and you want to say it's where you've We could just do turn and talks all day long thinking of ideas. We really could, but we want to get a good solid start on this chart. So we're going to move forward, and I'm going to go with Adam's idea. I'm just going to pick his. He says it's uh, like a Carnival County Fair. Fair enough, because that's probably where most of us have been. And not a lot of us have been to Disneyland or Disney World or Six Flags or whatever. And if this is a birthday party, that seems a little more reasonable, okay? So, um... Mrs. Klein and Adam, will you come up and write, let's just, should we say Winnesheet County Fair since this person's in our class? Okay, we got our problem. Events leading to the problem. Pull out your writing notebooks to that web that we did. Do you remember how we got stuck on everybody wanting to talk about all of the games? Okay, we, we can name some of those. But that's not what our problem is, so we can't stay there too long. <coughs> so we better include, right, that this is a birthday party? Thea, do you want to include that in events leading to a problem? So how many people? Each twin gets to bring how many friends, says mom or dad? Three? Maybe one each. One each, okay. So four friends enjoying a birthday party. Good way to spend your birthday. What happens? This is where the pre-writing stage gets a, becomes a little more difficult because we know what we want the problem to be. But how does that ever happen? What are you writing me now? Oh. What were you writing me? Oh, you guys talk. I don't, I don't know. What, what do you think, Ava? Um, that the worker has to climb up and get them. And but before that. Oh. Okay, what's kind of leading up? They're, they're not stuck yet. What do you think, Jocelyn? The problem hasn't happened yet. Okay, hey, they're going from ride to ride, buying tickets, going from ride to ride. Why don't you put that down? So, what are some rides that might be going on? Olivia. Fireball. Fireball. Dad. Oh, oh you spelled that one. Come on up. All right. So, they're bouncing around from ride to ride, just like if everybody's ever done wristband night, right? Everybody's yeah. having a great time running into some other friends you see, right? Should we put that down? Yeah. Mason, you want to write that? Seeing other friends as well? And you're going to write this down here. Jocelyn, this will actually go here because that's an event that's leading to our problem. That's not our problem yet. Well, they see a clown. Uh, they see a clown. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about, we can get to that, but how about three out of the four friends say, let's go on that one. What is the other friend thinking? <gasps> get me out of here! Right? No. But inside, because they don't want to tell their friends they're scared, right? So have you ever been in that situation? No. Something really daring is happening and you don't want to do it? Ethan, have you? You know that feeling, right? You're thinking in your head, if there was just any way I could disappear right now, that would be great. So we probably should add that. Would you, would that be okay? Yeah. As an event? Moira, would you write that? That one of the four friends is scared to go on, and we won't have to decide the ride quite yet. Fireballs. Um, this is like fireball. I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> friends. Friends. Seeing friends. Oh, seeing other friends around. That's right. 
Okay, describe the solution, okay? So we can add more to each of these, but we're gonna move on to describe solution. How, so they're stuck upside down and somebody said it over here. <coughs> we had already talked about the solution the other day. What was gonna happen? Or what happened? How are they going to get unstuck? Blood's rushing to their head, about to pass out, spit coming down. What's going to happen? <laughs> Will? Um, a fire truck and the water. Right. Fire department arrives um, and so forth. Will, why don't you write that one down? So we're bringing in our local heroes, right? Bringing in our local heroes on this one. Okay. And then the character's feelings. So if it's the twins, or I guess it could be all four friends. Do you want all four yeah. friends? Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Um, what are they feeling in the end? What do you think that one friend who was scared to begin with feels like? Noah? Scared. At the end. <laughs> Probably still scared. Right? Shaking. Ava? Dizzy and like, oh, that was so weird. Why did I did that? <laughs> Absolutely. What do you think, Nick? I got one. I got one. Can you think of a word where after something traumatic has happened, what do you feel? Relieved. Really? Perfect. Will you do your best to put that one up there? What do you still think that one friend is thinking? Quick, quick turn and talk, and I'm going to give some hints. Start with the degree. 
degree. And so what we're going to do for this is we're going to do what's called basically a whip around. And we're going to start with round one. And we may go around more than once basically with the whip around. And what you're going to do is you're going to start with basically um, what did you see. And you're going to do this in a non-judgmental manner. So you're not judging Jen, obviously, with what you saw Jen doing. This isn't about her. Um, so you're going to use language such as, I saw, I heard, I noticed, um, from your notes. So um, we'll start and we'll go kind of one round. You always have the right to pass if it kind of comes to you and you're not sure what to say or you don't feel comfortable saying anything, that's fine. You always have the right to pass. So is there anyone? We don't have to go in an actual circle. We can just go however. So is there anyone that's willing to start? Sure. Oh, okay, go ahead. I, no, go for it. I noticed lots of turn and talk. I noticed when you asked a question and you had like silence and you gave them plenty of wait time and then you said, well, turn and talk. And then they could get their answers. I noticed, um, I think it's a couple kiddos, their ideas got off the main topic. And how does, does this fit with that instead of? I saw students taking charge of their own learning by coming up and writing their own thoughts on the chart that they came up with without saying, no, I don't know about that. Anything they really came up with on the chart. Um, I heard students on task during this um, turn talks. They weren't talking about other things. They were talking exactly about what you would ask them to talk about. And that's how I notice how mood can be used um, with books and how that affects the reader. I noticed smiles on the children's faces. I noticed hands in the air, and when they had the opportunity to turn and talk, they all turned and talked. <laughs> well, I also noticed how interactive we kept the writing lesson. Yeah. Just the up, up to the board, turn and talk, uh, writing in there. I noticed that you guided the class to like more logical ideas. So even when their ideas seemed like, eh, that's not really possible, you guided them back to, this has to be realistic. Remember, this really happened to our student or our classmate. So. I saw procedures in place. Students knew when they gave an idea, they could come and write. Um, I also heard when you say class, they would respond with yes. They responded all the I heard you tell the class that it was more important to get their ideas written down and not to focus on the spelling. And the first group of kids that came up automatically did that. I also heard you ask who hasn't had the opportunity to write on the board. I saw how you, how you transitioned uh, what they were doing as a group to now applying it to their own. And I heard you reference previous lessons so they could make that connection. I noticed when the kids opened their writing notebooks, I was from a distance, but what I could see is that some were written in just plain writing format and others had pictures, others had words in different, different places on their pages, all different inside their writing. I noticed that you started your lesson by making a personal connection to yourself so that can make it more engaging for the students right away. Any other I heard, I saw, I noticed? Okay. So round two, for the work round is what was the impact on student learning? So basically, how was the te how was the teaching, um, in, or how did the teaching impact student learning? <clears throat> and we'll kind of do the same thing, just in a um, whip around, but then you always have the right to pass. And 
I didn't have to basically say, okay, we'll go around again. You guys just kept going, so that was that was easy. So we'll kind of just do the same format and kind of keep those focus questions in your mind also too um, that are on the front and back and also um, some of those things that Jen had you um, look for that um, for her student that was autistic and also that evidence um, of the pre-writing in her classroom. So whoever would like to start, um, can start. I'm not 100% sure if this is how you want this to go, but okay. I'm going to say it and you can tell me if I'm completely out of line. But um, the turn and talk, from my perception, allowed kiddos that were unsure of what to say or maybe uncomfortable saying out loud the opportunity to still engage in process and then possibly built their confidence to raise their hand. And I have no data to support that, but um, it did allow them to engage in the, the lesson. I think the connection between the graphic organizer and in the enhancing with the beginning and end so, so that students would see that they may need to add more details and then that will help them with their drafting process. So it was a great progression between the pre-writing, pre-writing to drafting. I think using uh, the book on the, the YouTube video also encouraged students to know that whatever ideas they had were a good idea. They were their idea, something that they could take. I noticed that the students really seem to have a handle on what pre-writing is. You started out your lesson asking, what do we call that? You know, going back to what Ann said, I felt like the story that you used in the beginning uh, led to a positive lesson, saying that it's okay to have a different idea. I really liked that book. Students are there. I was going to understand why plan and setting this to move forward so that they could com help complete the picture. I noticed the students were eager to add to their own list of topics I can write about. I think that, oh, oh. I was going to say, I think doing the, the class personal narrative allows them to like, get rid of that fear of, you know, like, any ideas are acceptable and that sort of thing so that when it comes time to do their own, that fear is kind of washed away. I think it's a good model and so then when it comes to their own steps, they have that background of really what they've done as a class and it's not threatening in that way. They can take what they have learned and apply it to their own and feel confident that they can make a, a good grade piece or one that they're proud of. Noticing the ideas that they had on their first brainstorming things I could write about. And then after starting the class story, able to refocus what might make a good story. Mm -hmm. I, I broke my arm yeah, or something else and said, I've had a seat hot dog. <laughs> and I think it's, that's my class. <laughs> yeah, I know it's <laughs> Um, and also thinking about, so one of the questions was what structures are evident and in place for students to be successful writers? And that kind of goes along with um, this, the impact of student learning. So what types of things did you guys see that was evident and in place for those structures for the students to be successful? I know you guys have already mentioned a lot of those, so anything else that you guys saw that was instantly in place. I know we mentioned routines and procedures. Well, I noticed on the wall she had procedures for the expectations for writing, which has already been established, so they already know some of those procedures ahead of time, but it's always there to refer back to if they get off track. Go back in the anchor chart. I'm giving you guys good trying to give you wait time. <laughs> <laughs> it takes time for the students to do the writing, but it's well worth it. It's their ideas on the children's figures so they're more engaged in the classroom discussion. I thought in terms of management and with, um, with Adam, I thought that the turn talks allowed him to have discussions and then you 
did a, and then he had his voice heard and then he was able to in that appropriate time be able to go up the chart as well so he he was not just sitting as a passive learner he was also active so i thought that that was for him to feel engaged and that was one of the look forfs that you were mm -hmm. kind of wondering too if, if he was engaged in the learning so um and also do the students understand the pre-writing stage of the writing process so how did that impact the student learning or was that evident in the student learning i know we kind of already touched on some of these as it's as we've been going around the whip around but anyone want to comment on that even just starting <clears throat> how you know i had this idea for this book i'm gonna write with my friend and they you know automatically knew oh you could write it on sticky notes or write it in your notebook or you know even just the fact that they know like yeah when i have an idea i can't just keep it up here and expect to remember it later like i need to get it written down and so like that's an important part of pre-writing just getting your ideas down on paper and you've obviously done a good job of instilling that in them I think just the idea of having the organization of getting their ideas organized so that when they do start their rough draft, they already know what they're really going to be writing about rather than making it up as they go along. Yeah, going along with that, I noticed that they weren't trying to tell you the story. They were just focusing on the skin pockets that were on the chart. Any other thoughts on the impact of student learning? <clears throat> so round three um, is for reflective questions. And so this is just questions you guys have. And um, I know sometimes this is done one of two ways where Jen can answer the question right away or we can wait and then We'll all ask our questions, and then the next round, um, she can answer them. So I think maybe we'll have you guys <clears throat> ask questions, and then the next round, you can answer them. So this is basically any questions you guys have about the lesson, the students, maybe about your own um, writing process or in your own classroom, or maybe <clears throat> kind of maybe book. the book, yeah. Um, so we'll kind of go the same thing, you have the right to pass, and in the flip around. The question that's in my mind is back to the writing notebooks. When they open them up, they all look very different, and I wondered, um, you know, if they created that organization on their own, or if you had modeled different ways that they possibly could organize thoughts, or um, if it was just a fluke that they were, you know, structured differently, or how did that happen? What led to that? I'm wondering what direction you gave them um, when they were writing um, topics I can write about. Um, you know, did you just say make a list or did you go into more detail like um, what could you actually write a story about? Because I'm thinking about the one child I saw, ice cream, hair, fish. But then I saw another child who said, the day my dog jumped on me, the day I something. You mentioned in the pre-briefing the different <coughs> graphic organizers that the kids could use. So I'm wondering if that's part of the like the very beginning pre-writing stages. Then are you going to expect them to all do kind of their own beginning, middle, end thing where they have to then add more detail before you can really begin the drafting process? Which lessons um, you combine together and then are they sticking with the reading, the, the 30 days of reading, are they close together? Do you have to combine some of them? Are you transitioning from what is happening in the, the reading, transition to the writing? How is that flowing together? Is it flowing together? Is this somewhat separate? So you don't have to yeah. oh, like a man. I hear you over there writing them. So 
thinking processing. <laughs> I have a question. I come from a different background, though. Uh, but I was just wondering how you modify writing lessons or accommodate writing lessons because my class is there's a very wide range of being up here to way down here. So I'm just curious on how you modify or accommodate. Mm -hmm. Or how to <laughs> Okay. okay, so then the next round, you can answer those questions. So we'll start with, um, I think the first question was about the writing notebooks. Did you have that more specific? Yeah, they're okay. different. Did you help them structure that? What led to the notebooks? Mm -hmm. Why did they look different? <clears throat> and how did they structure um, so I think the page you might be referring, some are the same and some are different. Like the page that I had to go to with the web, they got to pick. However, they could organize it in their mind, and how they wanted to do it on their paper was fine with me. Not everybody likes to do that web. Um, so I, as long as they got the thoughts down, if they wanted to make a list or a chain or, yeah, it was up to them. Um, and then that kind of goes back to the graphic organizers um, later being up to them, which ones they want to use. Which kind of leads me to Jackie's question. And yes, I think, um, so there's also several graphic organizers for beginning, middle, and end too. Mm -hmm. So I almost think, like what you were saying, there, there has to be two different ways of showing that evidence before you can move to the rough draft. And one leads to the other. Because uh, the one that was under the document camera was different than the one that we did today. But I don't know if we could have gotten today if we hadn't had that one. Mm -hmm. So yes, I would say they'd have to have, you know, their choice of the graphic organizer, just getting, um, kind of managing their ideas. But then yes, evidence of some kind of sequence for their story. All three of your questions. <laughs> Did you feel like you had it answered? Mm -hmm. um, what direction did you give them on topics they should write about? So, yes, there were some, th that list that we went back to today was long ago. So that was really um, more of, I would say, a second grader's thoughts. You know, what are, and Sarah's shaking her head, you know, <laughs> what are the ideas? You know, it's just kind of, um, we're just diving into this. Uh, what do you know so far? Uh, but I was, so then today, so that was like two weeks ago. Well, by now they should really, yeah, I've given many examples and the one that I thought of that this book has, I know I mentioned it before, is Arthur Writes a Story. And that's really where I saw a lot of kids like open their eyes. Oh, because that story really talks about um, appropriateness, relevancy, um, can you write a story, is that going to be like three sentences or can I create a whole page? Um, so that's where I started seeing um, better thought ideas. And then I think through this process, everybody's um, knock on wood today should have been, you know, even I know which one you're talking about, the hot dog, whatever. Um, even today, he, I mean, he's getting there. Today he had mopeds and four wheelers. And I said, okay, so did something happen? And that's the tough part where we're at right now is, um, personal narrative doesn't necessarily have to be a, an exciting or tragic moment. It doesn't have to be filled with something totally outland, you know, outlandish that's happened to you. Because, I mean, it just has to be one of the most memorable things for you. And if you can recall the details, beginning, middle, and end, and you can re recall the setting and who was there and describe how people felt or how you felt, then I think that is the perfect topic for you for a personal narrative. Um, sometimes, you know, I think one of the, the funniest topics, and I, I've gotten it every year except for this year so far, kids want to write about when I was a baby. 
Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> you don't remember that. <laughs> you know, and then they'll try. Yeah, I do. I do remember. No. <laughs> well, my mom does. Right? But then that would be her story to share. And this is just about what you remember. <laughs> So, let's see if I've done a better job this year. <laughs> I haven't gotten that question yet. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. So, as the class story, how did you decide on that one topic? Yeah, so we had several, <laughs> several ideas. Um, and we finally narrowed it down to these. Um, deer hit by sister screaming. Time with the pet. Oh, and then when the deer then ran, the principal hit the deer in her car. Um, time with a pet, going to a special place, a time you accidentally broke something, a time you were a hero. And then from there we just voted. We took the top two, so a time you accidentally broke something, which I really wish we would have picked, <laughs> would have got more votes. <laughs> this hanging upside down just scares me, to be honest with you. I don't know how we're going to get out of it. But we included our local heroes, so it worked out. Um, so then, that's yeah. It was a voting process, and you know, and we talked about um, how it's okay if your idea didn't get picked because we're gonna have, have multiple opportunities to write. Well, we will have real realistic fiction writing. You know, we will have stories where it's all you and you. And so then that brings it back to Making Sense of the Writer's Workshop where you're just developing enjoyment for, for writing. You know, when you see kids disappointed because they didn't, their idea didn't get picked, it's almost like, okay, something's right here. They want their idea to be picked rather than, eh, okay. You know, there's a big difference, so. So this maybe isn't a question, but it's a follow up to that. That was one thing I noticed when they would turn and talk, like, okay, turn and talk about the characters, do you want them to be twins? Is it just one girl, is it one boy, you know, whatever. And then I I was wondering, are you gonna have them vote on everything? But it was just right. the person that you called on, whatever they decided, that's what went up on the board, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So. so the graphic organizer's question, I think that one was the next one, which you Jackie's, yeah. kind of answered. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, will they all be expected to always do the beginning, middle, end? You're sorry, Jackie? And yeah. that was, um, are they sticking with the 30 days of the week? Um, if I sat down and looked at my plans, it would take me a little time, but I would be able to tell you which lessons I, it, it's such a neat process with, with the first 30 days of writing and the first 30 days of writing because, well, now in my fourth grade of, fourth year of doing this, well, third year with writing, um, it's, it's like they're the same. They're just always like, you know what I mean? And so there are lessons I don't do in here and there are lessons that I don't do in reading that fit better in writing, that I bring to writing instead. Um, so I feel it's most important to make sure they're taught. But if I can do it better with the mentor text and something we're doing in reading, then I'll do it then. Um, but that is a really good question. And yeah, I pulled that off the top of my head. But I think they do, you know, reading you just did turn and talk and then the writing. The same day it's turn and talk. Right. It's a chance to right. Revisit that. What does that look like? Right. Right. It continues. So by the time the they next reach fourth day. grade, they know that we don't teach it. Right. Because we just that's just part right. of doing Yeah. It. And there's I've no actually reason. been in there, and maybe I can answer this because I've been in there quite a few times where Jen has said, "We just learned this in reading. Think about what we just talked about <laughs> in reading," and it carries over to what they were doing in writing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it just trickles over right into their writing process. So which that progression to more quickly. Yeah. And so with that it's not really thirty days for me either. With either. You know, because mm -hmm. I'm getting two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. That's the leads into the next question. Are you how do you transition reading and writing? What flows together? What is separate? Mm -hmm. How do you work with that? <clears throat> so uh, logistically, the way the schedule is set up is reading is first and then writing follows. 
Uh, I know last year we talked about how, or maybe it was more me thinking this, but I do know we talked about it, how nice it would be if the writing and reading units could match up, but it's impossible because there are 10 reading units and only five writing. But, so, but sometimes it gets a little tricky because, and I'm gonna be off on this, but you might be doing personal narrative writing and realistic fiction reading, or you know, vice versa. So then you really, you have to um, review before every lesson, especially in writing. Okay, I know we just worked on this in reading. So switching from genres is, can be tricky. Um, however, it's always easier when the one has already been done. Does that make sense? We've already done this genre in reading, now we're, so, so then it becomes, it flows because they have I think it's that. easier to start it in reading because mm -hmm. they have an example of what realistic fiction looks like mm -hmm. and sounds like in order to then now that we've talked about it in reading now you can write your own right um, and benchmark writing does a, a really nice job of having mentor text too with every writing unit I mean I feel like the first week at least is just reading stories uh, written by kids, by other kids, sometimes, and so that helps too. And some, and y'all use like some of the writing benchmark I'll use in small group reading, or some of the books from reading I'll use as whole group writing. Do you usually read the whole book in one setting, or do you read parts of it? In the writing, they're short enough, probably seven minutes, maybe all the writing mentor texts. Would you guys agree? The writing is much shorter. The reading mentor texts can be a little bit longer. Yeah. Sometimes I just replace it with my read aloud. Just do it then. Because it's hard to stop reading a book and then try to pick up on it later. It can be kind of tricky. Yeah, that, you know, Karen, going back to your question about reading and writing and what you take out. Um, yeah, I think I, I am, you know, being a third year with both, it just kind of is innate in me now. I don't have to think about it as much. Um, but I, that is a great idea to just do and to have. Well, even your first year to your second year, now next year you may even Leave more things out, yes. or it's been combined together because mm -hmm. the kids have been exposed to it. In the first yeah. 30 days of writing, isn't there? There's a calendar mm -hmm. right on the inside, and on that, I have all my uh, notes on what I did. But that was three years ago, so it's changed, like mm -hmm. you're saying. Mm -hmm. But I, I could start with that, you know, because even then I was, you know, you see turn and talk there, you see turn and talk there, you're not going to do them in both places, so. But even math, I've even brought um, some of those nonfiction features that you do in reading. Mm -hmm. I do those and cover those in math. So I'm really, you know, social studies too with TCI. I'm getting a lot of that done in other areas as well. Or at least reviewing them in those other areas because they are pretty hard concepts for third graders, I think. Show us the glossary, you know, you've think that they should get it maybe faster than they do, but every book is different. Right. So. Um, let's come back, because I think Alyssa had the question about accommodations and modifying. So let's skip that one so she can hear it. She can hear that. Um, let's see. And that's all I have. OK, and I had just put the question on, um, because I know this has been brought up to me too, about 30 minutes of writing every day. Mm -hmm. And that is something that you... Yeah, so that that's what is tough about making sense of the writer's workshop and trying to fit it in and it's not their fault and it's not our fault, it's just time. How much time in the day do you have for writing? And let's face it, our writing block just has to be shorter compared to the other things that we have to try and get in throughout the day. So I'll, I do try to make at least a couple minutes of something short, brief, something we can share out. Um, but otherwise, there's always something 
there's always uh, 15 minutes in a rotation there that is always um, kind of saved for something to do with writing. And it might have something to do with our writing lesson. More times than not, it will. But it might not either. Sometimes it might just be write an entry in your personal journal, you know. But it's 15 minutes of them writing. Um, something they can do independent without needing my help. Or something that I know they're not going to be engaged in. So does that include like your reading response? Like it's, or is that separate? Separate. Okay. Yeah. So, so the actual um, physical motion of writing, there's another 15 minutes where they might be doing a response journal. Mm -hmm. You know, writing summary, connecting their book to themselves or to text. So, definitely writing. <laughs> but, but I feel like you have to have this time, the mini lesson is just not mini. I mean, the, the concepts that they have to learn and when we get into grammar and how to form a paragraph and all that, I mean, it just takes time. So there's the time for reading. You know, and I feel bad saying that it can't be really in writing class, but it is somewhere. You know, that would be like me saying, well, I have to teach the reading lesson, so there's no time for read to self. You know, that's awful. Um, it is happening just at a different time. So we'll go back, Alyssa, to your question on um, how you modify or accommodate your writing lessons. Um, the, um, for the actual mini lesson, I'm trying, for the whole group, I, I can't say that I would accommodate much more than this. Um, if it involves students writing, there's definitely a difference. You know, um, Adam has a one-on-one, -on -one, so he's working with somebody. Um, I know the kids that I would absolutely have to work with, maybe in a small group. Um, some kids would probably have uh, not as much to write. You know, I have some kids that just write slow. I mean, their ideas are so great, but they really care about their penmanship, and I don't want to take, you know, so it's just like, a lot of differentiated, but overall, like the the meat of the task is the same for everybody. It's just how much do I expect is a little different. Yeah, you know, I don't want I don't want a struggling writer to just write down as many words as they can and just to to meet my quota. You know, I'd rather have their their ideas be worth something, and you know, goes back to purpose. Because, well, then they'll just probably hate writing even more. You know, I do that. But not that I let them off the hook either. I mean, a lot of that, those two minutes, the you know, we have recess, and I would never take a child's recess away, but it does put a little pressure on them. Two minutes, and I have to see your three ideas, and they have to be something that you can give me some detail about when I ask you. So they know they just, you know, Pepsi, whatever. They're, we're to the point now where if I stop and ask you, tell me about what happened with the Pepsi, um, you're going to have a story for me. Yeah. Is that all the questions, Sarah? Yeah. I think that's all that I had, too. OK. Uh, also, um, Alyssa, even paper for some students is different. Mm -hmm. um, some have, like a, I don't even remember what it's called anymore. I, I still use it, but it has like a little lift on it for kids who just have, you know, OT kinds of things. Um, there's that, or some just need wider space to write on. That's really all it is. You know, just trying to squeeze those letters in the wide line papers can be tough. <laughs> Any other questions that you guys have? So one of the, um, the last focus question was kind of a self-reflection question, reflective question. Imagine we walk into your classroom. Is there a feeling of purpose that the students are dedicated to writing? 
and are your reading and writing blocks connected? So kind of thinking about that question and this last final um, round five for the whip around, um, just kind of stating your own future kind of next steps um, that arose from the observation. So just kind of take a minute to kind of think about that and based on the focus question and then whoever would like to start. <clears throat> And maybe some of you had some aha moments or realizations, or maybe some of you are feeling like, oh, that felt good to see I'm doing some of this, or. I plan to use Turn and Talk in a more purposeful way, or to use it more often, I guess, because I use it at the beginning of my lesson just to get them talking, but even just like then during your instruction when you're you ask them and you see that only a few kids have ideas. All right, let's turn and talk about it, you know? So just using it more frequently. I think it's last year, I know you were doing the whole class stories to model as you had the new Johnny's. And so then I tried that and I really want to do that more this year. The different skills that are presented to do the class to help spark their interest, their, uh, encourage them. I've always introduced um, the writing process at the beginning of the year and then I have just jumped right into their own personal narratives and kind of modeled the process that way with their own pieces but I want to now I think do a whole class shared writing so that they have a better deeper understanding of maybe what the process should be. kind of go the same way as that because that's what we usually do. We make we do make some less like the ten most like events and or the seven most like events and the ten best like events and you know they brainstorm all of that and then selecting one of those events that they do rather, you know, that it, it'd be a probably a better idea to do a class one. So it would be something that they'd be able to then take one of those like events and go with it. Can I? Say something here or not? I, also, well, that, no, that brings me to, I just don't know if I was supposed to talk. Um, the lessons after. So, and I've done that in the past too, where I just kind of uh, teach the lessons and then they're off on their own. Even the rest of the process is so important. Like, when we do this rough draft, we do it on big lined paper, like a giant notebook, right? And they're writing. But even to go through that revision process together, um, and go through that edit process together. I have found the pre-writing and those two steps are just awesome to do together. Otherwise, I, I really have memories of kids within five minutes, I'm done with revision and done with edit. How, you know, well I never really, we never did it together and like live through it together. So I really, I really do like doing that part together for sure. It takes time, you know, I got kids writing it out on that, but it's neat to see too. Well, it shows how modeling is really important for that revision step, especially at the end. That's, that is that is true, because they seem to go through it lickety-split. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little especially the revising, not so much the editing, but the sure. revising of ideas. Sounds good. And what? knowing the difference yeah, between revising and editing, mm -hmm. being differences, and seeing right. how that can be done by the model that you do as a class. What did we talk about too as far as conferencing? Using, oh yeah, some technology form, but um, I can't remember exactly. It was something in here we said we could just make and put it on like a Google Doc. Holly had asked me, so what do you use for conferencing? And I was like, oh yeah, that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wasn't, I was like trying to get familiar and then we saw some forms in here and Jen had said she liked one and then we decided, oh, we could just make a Google form and the kids could do it on their own on the iPad, the on the iPad okay. and submit it so Jen wouldn't have to like find their form every time and check in. They, she could just like check in one place every time on the Google response forms to see where every and they, student is at. Right, and they'd have to have like their proof that they're ready for you mm -hmm. instead of... I'm ready, you know, I'm ready. 
and then you're kind of wasting another student's time that really is ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really did like that. So Holly's going to make that for us, right, Holly? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was really simple. Pretty quick. I guess moving forward, we did the modeling last year, the class story, the pre-write, the graphic organizer, and then it was, they had their, this really nice graphic organizer, how characters were the thinking, and all the steps. And then I still had, even after modeling, some kids would just copy and try to turn that one. Jenny was the girl. And just taking the things from the graphic organizer and trying to mm -hmm. put it into sentences or, okay, I'm tired, so I'm gonna leave that part out. Mm -hmm. And just thinking the steps that we went through, how to help them move to make it a smooth flowing story, beginning, middle, end that makes <coughs> sense instead of, uh, I thought, okay, I guess they didn't catch that part. No, I, I <laughs> were glad you maybe that's that just up. where they, that's just right where they are with their learning. Yes. And that, or maybe just not ready for that step um, or modeling. How do I take them back to where they need to be? Would be another place that I need to go towards. When you start like the class drafting, will you only do the big chart or will you also expect them all to be at their tables writing in their own notebooks, whatever or the class all, story is? There's only one big okay. paper. Yeah. I do find that incredibly hard, Karen. And I, I do see that. I, that's why I'm sure I'm sure it's on me, but I also think it's on them as eight and nine year olds too. This is what they know, and look at how much they've already learned. And you know, you can't learn everything in a day. So I'm the graphic organizer, plugging it in, plugging it in. Well, that that's just something to go off of. That's not transferable for the rough draft, and that is a hard. Yeah. Um, anybody has any? ideas on how to teach that, that would be welcoming because I have the same struggles. So some so naturally in others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have different backgrounds right. depending on the, what, how they had learned the year previously. Mm -hmm. So I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good readers make better writers too because they read more. Right. They get exposed to more. They, they know how stories should sound. And so they want their stories to sound like they too. When you take the information from the graphic organizer to the writing, do you specifically acknowledge that? Oh, we have this information here, and now we're going to change it up mm -hmm. to write me specifically mm -hmm. acknowledge that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when they're on their own, I think that's the hardest thing for them to do on their own. Yeah, because mm -hmm. to come up, even you know when we're doing a whole group, then you go back to all those ideas again because it brings more brain, more pre-writing. You know, brainstorming mm -hmm. um, but I like a mediator there to kind of but then by themselves you know it's generating more and more and more ideas which they just might not have or they you know and that even gets into other things like honestly I I think that light music helps like when they're at that stage um, just something that helps them okay we're in this moment right now I don't know if any of you use um, like easy, easy listening music when they're doing independent writing, but I found it eliminates talk, you know, talking that shouldn't be happening, and it, it just kind of. And I have students that we were doing a writing activity for oh I don't even PBIS or some it was for something, and somebody said, "Can we turn that music on so I can think?" You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think with that, though, it's an understanding that pre-writing, you're just getting some ideas on the paper, but then drafting, you are expanding those ideas and putting more details. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just an understanding of maybe what the writing process should be as well. Mm, sure. But that's a hard thing to teach, and that's just yeah. developmental as well. And I struggle well, yeah, with you yeah, that. Well, yeah, because you're also teaching how to write a sentence, that is a complete <coughs> sentence with mm. a thought, you know, and taking that simple sentence and maybe expanding it. <coughs> yeah, that's, I, that's a process in itself. I even just developed this my first third year teaching right here in third grade was, okay, that's enough. You must have five words per sentence. It's just going to be my rule from now on. I was so tired of seeing three word sentences. It was like five.
five, got to be five. Everything you do on your word study assessment, quick check, on your math, exit slip, everywhere, just know five. And so then I have to be really cognizant about my five word sentences. And then three sentence paragraphs. Has to be three sentences per paragraph. And so, um, yeah, you're worried. Yeah, you start getting into all that as well. Sure. <laughs> Screams like haiku. <laughs> <laughs> Word, word. Yeah, that's very possible. In the moment, I... Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Battery. Will they take this, um, I guess I'm asking a question, will they take this personal narrative to to publish format or just... Yep. So that we'll have um, a big, you know, another big giant sheet that then it's pub the publishing part, but then um, we also take turns and we type it up. And then, like last year, we sent it to the third grade team if they wanted to read it to their class, to Mrs. Miller, um, Holly. So you'll all get it. Because um, we were talking about purpose and audience. And then when I, we first brought up that you were coming, I said, oh, and there are more people who will read it. And your parents will read it. And, um, and, and then we talk about how it's not scary. It, it's just exciting. And that's what it means to be an author. People want to read your work. And then um, the space below my whiteboard is where I put the big published sheets and they stay up all year. And I'm curious too, does anyone use like, during the writing process, like author's chair, like for published work and stuff? They love that. Yeah, yeah they do. Because that's another way I think that they can see. Oh, this this will be important right. to even, share. Even it. when they're in the process, this is what I've written so far, or this is what I have. And for others yeah. to hear, oh wow, that's that's what mine should right. maybe sound or look like. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you have yeah. so far? It's another reason why I like um, Arthur writes a story because they do end up sharing that. And when he shares his idea just to you know, individual friends or family, um, he's getting all this feedback. But then when he presents it to the class, he's so confident because it's everything he really wanted to do. But that does talk about being a speaker as well. Which really is a whole other gamut that goes back to reading too, it, being a speaker. that The first thing that I ever have the kids get up and do is that important book that they have to read. And every year I have two or three kids who I, I, they ask that I stand up there with them. And it's so neat to see those kids who were, who were so scared. Last year I think I might have had them stand with me while I read theirs. Um, but then, you know, a couple months later, they want to go first or, you know, they're excited to read it. And then it's much more fun when they have illustrations to go with it, like um, procedural Mm -hmm. uh, text writing, so then there are papers under the document camera so we can see their illustrations too, and then they're up there reading and then they kind of feel like the teacher. Mm -hmm. So, Any other final thoughts or things for the future I might try? <coughs> Well, I just, I, I do want to say, um, it's not like I'm trying to sell this to you, like I wrote this and I, I really want you to buy it. Um, but, and I know some of you have been teaching longer than I have, and you have a, a much better idea of how to teach writing than I do. Um, but for me, it, it has lessons in there that I would have otherwise left out. I, or I wouldn't have taught them this way with this text that really sparked something in them. I maybe would have picked a book that wasn't as good, or just little things like that, or I maybe wouldn't have created that anchor chart because to me it was, oh, that's so simple. Does it show the ways of brainstorming? Like, I can just say that. Well, actually putting it on paper and creating that chart, just those things, those tools really make a difference. I love the text that they suggested over here. Yeah. Any other final thoughts? Thank you.
All right. Well, thank you guys for participating and thank you, Jen, for hosting. Yeah.